Well, if you want to go ahead and make your way to the Gospel according to John tonight, chapter 17. John chapter 17. And tonight I want to begin a study on John 17. And those who are familiar with this chapter already know that it's often referred to as the high priestly prayer. Though some argue that this is somewhat misleading since Jesus had not yet ascended to the right hand of the Father, uh, where he now we know that he makes intercession on our behalf. I don't know what else you would call it. It certainly has the language of him praying on behalf of his people. Uh, whatever you may refer to it, whether that is just a foretaste of his ministry or whether this would be called the high priestly prayer, one of the things that we can note about this is it is the, the greatest prayer uh, that is recorded in all of history. The fact that we have access to this prayer uh, reminds us that we, we are indeed on hallow ground when we look at and examine this prayer. And so uh, as we come to this, I... Uh, I typically, when I approach a passage like this, you know, you've been with me for some time, we just go verse by verse through it. I really want to give a broader perspective tonight. I want to do an overview of, of this. I don't know how much of that we'll be able to do, uh, but, I, but my, my goal is to, to give a, a bigger picture. I, w I want to look at it, especially as it pertains to our salvation, um, I mentioned it being a high priestly prayer, and we know that uh, whether it was in the upper room or right after the upper room, that this is leading up to Gethsemane before he goes to the cross, where he will secure salvation uh, for his people through his redemption. Uh, it's a beautiful passage of Scripture. Uh, I think also, let me just note this before we get into this, uh, chapter 16 verse 33 kind of helps us to put something in perspective. Sometimes we come to this and, and it's, it's pictured in a solemn, somber way, but, but notice how verse number 33 of chapter 16 ends. He says, in the world, speaking to his disciples, you have tribulation, but take courage, I have overcome the world. And so it's on the heels of this, he's done what the Lord what his father had sent him to do. Uh, he has accomplished that. And the cross is there as he enters into this. He's not a victim. He, he's, you know, this is not, as you hear him say, I have overcome the world. This is not the words of a victim or the words of someone who is not in control of what is about to happen. This, he willingly, willfully laid down his life for his sheep. And so we should see this in light of that, that this is leading up to the cross. And so as we think about what is said here, um, just one other thing. Let me just note this. I, I want us to kind of pay attention to the salvation as, as we read through this. I, I'm, we're going to read through the whole thing. And what is it that you think about when you think of your salvation? And I know for many of us, we relate our salvation to the moment we were saved. Or the events that led up to that. Um, maybe the decision, ever have we want to word that. Um, we know it's an act of grace in our life. But, but when we began to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, when we think about salvation, typically we think of it in those terms. But we don't often think of it in terms of eternity. And typically when we talk about salvation, we think of it in terms of individually, you think about, I think that's our bias uh, because of where we live. We, we are biased to think individually. And yet, when we will see this, as we read through this, uh, it's much about a people. It's corporately. Uh, and salvation is not something, as we often think about, just something in the present. But as we will see in a moment, it is something that goes back to eternity past. So, John chapter 17, beginning in verse number 1, 
And we read that Jesus spoke these things. And lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you, even as you gave him authority over all flesh that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world, They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have come to know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words which you gave me I have given to them. And they received them and truly understood that I came forth from you. They believed that you sent me. I ask on their behalf, I do not ask on behalf of the world, but of those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And all things that are mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. I am no longer in the world, and yet they themselves are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are. While I was with them, I was keeping them in your name, which you have given me, and I guarded them, and not one of them perished, but the son of perdition, so that the Scripture would be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. I have given them to you, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is true. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. For their sakes I sanctify myself, that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them, even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me Be with me where I am, so that they may see my glory which you have given me. For you love me before the foundation of the world. A righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you. And these have known that you sent me. And I have made your name known to them, and will make it known. So that the love with which you love me may be in them, and I in them. And this is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, Lord, as we peer into this passage of scripture, Lord, we are in awe of all that you have accomplished through the redemption of your son, redeeming a people for himself. And Father, as we begin to contemplate these deep eternal matters, Lord, I pray that you would open up our hearts, our mind, that you expand our thinking, that you would indeed sanctify us by your word. Lord, we ask that you would use this for the glory of Christ. May we marvel, may we be caught up and who he is, and the beauty of all he has done. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. But what I want to do tonight is is really just 
highlight some of the truths that are here. I, in my preparation, uh, even as I'm looking at this, it's somewhat overwhelming, I mean, just to think about this whole passage of Scripture. And we cannot exhaust all that is here tonight. But what I want to do is really just think of it in terms of our salvation. Again, as I was talking a moment ago, when you think about salvation, we typically think about it more me-centered. Um, but yet, when we read something like this, it puts in, into perspective of how God-centered we should be thinking about salvation. And so what I want to do, I want to highlight just a, a few truths from this passage of, of Scripture concerning salvation and um, and how we ought to think about salvation. And I, I, in my preparation, I, uh, there, there's so much that I've been reading. And uh, uh, one of the, one, uh, some years ago I read uh, John MacArthur's sermon. If you've ever read it, you can find it probably on his site. It's uh, whom, uh, Who Chose Whom. And uh, he deals with this passage as well. And it was, it, it was eye-opening for me years ago. Uh, Vody Bachman preached a, a, a sermon uh, on this particular passage of Scripture that, uh, uh, that I have borrowed from heavily. Uh, he, he, I mean, just some of the things that he said were enlightening. I was reading in the, some, of, some sermons in preparation for today as well, and uh, I think it was Anthony Burgess who was uh, a Puritan. He wrote uh, 100, and, I want to say he was 145 or 165 sermons just on John 17. Uh, we're, we're not going to do that tonight. We're not going to start 165 sermons, but rather what I want to do is just give you just a broad overview about thinking about our salvation. And, and I think, first of all, uh, we ought to think about our salvation in this way, that it begins with the love of God within the Godhead in eternity past. I'm, I'm starting to sound like a Puritan when I say that way, but I, I want you to hear this, that our salvation begins with the love of God within the Godhead in eternity past. And, and, and I want to emphasize that because, again, typically the way that we think about our salvation is we think about it in the present. But yet, what I want you to notice as Jesus is praying through this, I just want to highlight a couple things there. Going back to verse number one where he says, Father, the hour has come, glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. So Jesus asked the Father to glorify him. Look at verse number 5. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself. Notice this. With the glory which I had with you before the world was. Look down to verses 23 and 24. Notice it says, I in them and you in me that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, be with me where I am so that they may see my glory, which you have given me, for you love me before the foundation of the world. And what I want to emphasize in this is that in eternity past, and it's important when we think about our salvation, that it is rooted in the love within the Godhead. That is, that there was a perfect love within the Godhead. The Father loves the Son perfectly. The Son loves the Father perfectly. Uh, the Spirit is a personifies the, the love of the Father and the love of the Son. We, we, we should think about a, a perfect unity. And one of the things that we see in this, we see that Jesus had a glory beforehand, before the foundation of the world, and that there was a love relationship before the foundation of the world. Now, why is that important? I think it's important because we, we need to start with this perfect love within the Godhead because we tend to think about salvation in terms of God's love for us. When we think about love, we, we, we tend to, and, and, and probably I'm a part of that, that when I'm preaching, I talk about we need to be rescued, and, uh, and rightfully so. We do need to be rescued, and he does come to rescue us. But what we need to understand is that our salvation does not begin with us. It begins with this perfect love relationship, this perfect union within the Godhead. And, and, and we need to understand this. That this is nothing new, but we need to make sure that we get this down. 
that there's no inadequacies within the Godhead. In other words, it wasn't that God was lonely and needed a people, and so he created a people and then had to redeem a people. No, this perfect relationship in eternity past. This is where our salvation begins, that in the Godhead there was perfect oneness there. Look again at verse number 23. I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity. Verse 24. He speaks about that you love me before the foundation of the world. And even in verse 26 where he says, would you love me so that, they, so that the love which you love me may be in them and I in them. In other words, there's a perfect unity, a perfect love within the Godhead. But then the second reason that we need to remember that our salvation begins with the love of God within the Godhead is because we tend to think about salvific love in terms of salvation love. We tend to think of it in terms of our relationships. Now, we, we know when we come to the Scriptures, we see these metaphors that are there. For example, we see father and son, and, and we look at those relationships. Uh, we, we see uh, the relationship of husband and wife, and that, that uh, Christ is, is uh, the, the bridegroom, and we are the bride of Christ. And, and we see these, and, and if we're not careful, what we can do is we can grab a hold of those metaphors, and we could interpret them through, the, through our own relationships. In, in other words, if you were raised in a family where your parents were divorced, and you think about, you, you begin to look at it on this level, that you're looking at those relationships, if you start there and then try to move up to, to think about how God is, then you're starting in reverse order. So, so if, if you're, for example, you came from a family that will not forgive. I mean, they just hold grievances. They just hang on to things. They never let go. Well, it, you're going to struggle if you look at God in that way. If you begin with the horizontal and look to the vertical, what's going to happen is you're going to begin to think God is that way. And you're going to have a hard time understanding the grace of God and the forgiveness of God. And so it's, it's important that when we start thinking about our salvation, that we, that we start with the heavenly view. We think about God first. And so when we see the relationship, for example, between father and son, if my child were, were here, they would, they would say, well, he's imperfect. I would say the same thing about my dad. He's imperfect. But I don't start there. I look to the vertical. I, I, look, I look to God first. And then I understand that God perfectly, God the Father perfectly loves the Son. And I understand that if I want to look at a marriage relationship, then I look at the Son, that the Son is, shows us what it means to be a faithful husband, what it means to lay down his life for his bride. So I start there. So when I think about love, and this, and this gets really important when we think about our salvation, is that we, we, we must start with God first. And I understand that for some of us, it's difficult to get past those earthly relationships. But by the grace of God, we need to let the Scripture tell us who God is. And start there. Well, the second thing I want you to notice is not only is our salvation begins with the love of God and the Godhead, but our salvation is rooted and grounded in a love gift that the Father gave the Son. And this is really at the heart of this passage of Scripture. That our salvation is rooted and grounded in a love gift that the Father gave the Son. This is what scholars refer to as, uh, this is an example of what we... Scholars would call the covenant of redemption, that in eternity past, there was a covenant made within the Godhead. But I, I want you to see this, and, and, and I understand that even as I present this, that there are those who struggle with these verses, and yet there they are. I, I find that interesting. I, you know, you, 
I had a guy call me today. I, I haven't talked to this guy. The last time that I talked to him was when I was in Ephesians 1, and, and we were struggling, and he, he was struggling over election and predestination, and, and what's the odds of he calling me today when I'm starting John 17? And, and, and so I feel like the, 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 the Lord is preparing me for those conversations that I'm having with him. But, but here, here's one of the things, because when we, when we see this, when we think about salvation, we, we, we need to start with, let God be God. Let, let, let the Scripture say what it says. And what, what, where we have a problem, oftentimes, is what I just said a moment ago, is when we begin with the horizontal, and then try to figure out the vertical from there. In other words, when we get into election. We get into God chose a particular people for himself. Oftentimes we'll come with the mindset, well, that, you know, God ought to do it this way or that's not fair. And we have a democratic mindset. But the problem is, is when we start horizontally and move to the vertical, we need to let God be God and God say what he says. He doesn't need us to defend him. He doesn't need us to... Um, he, he didn't need anything. So, so let, let's just look at those verses. Look at verses 1 and 2 again. Where he, he's saying that, the, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, even as you gave him, he's talking about himself, authority over all flesh, over all mankind. He has the authority what? That to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. So, Jesus has the authority to give eternal life. Well, who is it that he's given eternal life to? It is those whom the Father has given him. Do you see that in verse 2? All whom you have given him. So, so God the Father has given a people to God the Son. Verse number 6. Here he's talking about his disciples. I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. So the Father gave a people to the Son. He, he's talking about here particular to those men, his disciples, his followers. But notice this. Verse number 9, I ask on their behalf. I do not ask on behalf of the world. Wait a minute. I ask on their behalf, but I, I do not ask on behalf of the world. I, I, I'm not praying for the world. I'm praying for those whom you have given me. That's what he says. But of those whom you have given me, for they are yours. So the Father has given a people to the Son. And when Jesus goes to pray for them, he doesn't pray for the world. He prays for those whom the Father has given him. Go down to verse number 24. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am so that they may see my glory which you have given me for you loved me before the foundation of the world. So there it is again. Whom you have given me. And, and what we see as he prays in this prayer, he prays not only for his disciples, but he also prays for us as well, those who would believe through their word. So, so when you think about salvation, do you think about it in those terms? That salvation begins with an expression of the Father's love for the Son. So out of love, the Father gives a people to the Son. That's what we see there. The Father's love for the Son. So in eternity past, God the Father gives a gift to the Son. And that gift that he gives, that people, is a people for his own possession. And again, do you see the implication of that? That means that God's salvation for you does not begin with you. All this is before the world was. All of this is in eternity past. The Father gave a people to His 
son. To his son. And in fact, there are numerous verses throughout John that we could look at that point to this same thing here. But here, here's what I want to get us tonight. This is good news. It, it's, unless you think it... In other words, it's not that... In, in our salvation, it's not that it starts with a love for you. But it starts with the Father's love for the Son. And why is that so significant? It's so significant because the Father has always perfectly loved the Son. And He always will. That's good. He always will. So, so, so in, in other words, because the Father loved the Son eternal, eternally and, and will never stop loving the Son, it brings us to the second point that we need to know that our salvation is secure. In other words, because all of this is rooted in the love that the Father has for the Son, and by the way, because the Father's love for the Son, He gives Him a people, and then the Son, because of His love for the Father, enters into this world and gives His life in order to redeem the people that God the Father has given Him before the foundation of the world, and the Holy Spirit applies the redemption that the Son has achieved to all those whom the Son died. So you have this, this and you have the love of the Father, the love of the Son, and the love of the Spirit. And they all are working in our salvation. Father gives a gift, the Son but out of love for the Father, goes and redeems that people whom the Father's given him. The Son, uh, the Spirit who personifies the love of the Father and the Son, applies the redemption to those people whom Christ died for. Let me ask you a question. Can we lose our salvation? Only if the Godhead ceases to exist. And, and it's not just this love and certainly that is enough. But the beauty of this, it, it certainly it brings up a lot of questions. But the beauty in this, as we think about this, the, the love of God, I mean, how, how, how am I going to know that this is going to be accomplished? It's going to take place. It brings us to the third point. Which is that ultimately our salvation is about the glory of God. It's really where we started tonight in our reading. We just took a roundabout way of getting there. But as you look at verse number 1, where Jesus spoke these things and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. And, and notice this, that glory is tied to verse number 2, even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. So the salvation of those whom the Father gave to the Son, the Son saves them for the glory of the Father, who in turn glorifies the Son. Why? Because he saved the ones whom the Father had sent him to glorify. In fact, look at verse 5. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I have had with you before the world was. Notice what he does this. In, the, in glorifying, when he tells him to glorify, he ties the redemption of the elect to the glory that he had of the past. Now, I know we're on some treading on some deep water, and when you get into this, I mean, I, I know I'm, you, you get into some, some deep things, but I, I want you to see this. He's praying. He, he's about to go to the cross. And he's telling, he's, he, he's asking the Father to glorify him, and, and 
He ties that to the elect. And that elect is tied to, by him redeeming the people that the Father has given him, he ties that, the glory that he's going to give him is to the, the same glory that he had in the past. I, I think Bodie Bachman said it's uh, an old glory. Not, not, not old glory like the flag, but I mean, this is old glory. But, what, but, but what, what, what I want you to see in that is that what's at stake is the glory of God. In other words, there would be no more glory in heaven. If he did not glorify the Son in accomplishing what he had sent him to do, if he had not done that, if he, he had not completed that act, there would be no glory in heaven. It, he ties it back to the glory that he had before. Glorify me with the same glory that I had in eternity past with you. He has to redeem the elect for the sake of the glory of God. One more, verse number 10. And then he says this, and all things that are mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. In whom? In the ones that the Father gave him. His glory is tied to our redemption. This is the last one, I promise. Verse 22. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them. Whoa that they may be one just as we are one. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them. Do, do you see how all of this is connected? And then he begins to talk about the oneness within the Godhead. And that oneness is where we started this tonight. So let, let, me, let me kind of summarize it this way. In eternity past, The Godhead in perfect union, in oneness, perfect love relationship did not need anything outside of that. Complete. The Father chose to give a people to the Son as an expression of love for the Son. And the Son, out of love for the Father, entered into this world and redeemed, accomplished the redemption of those people whom the Father had given him before the foundation of the world. And the Holy Spirit is the one who applies that redemption in time. All will be saved. All that the Father gave to the Son will be saved. All that the Son died for to secure their salvation through his redemption, will be saved. And all that the Son applies, what the Son, all that the Spirit applies, what the Son has done, will be saved in time. Every single one of them. Because it's tied to his glory. You say, well, what about, you know, I, I knew a guy that, I mean, he was walking with the Lord, and all of a sudden, you know, He'd been there, been a Christian, a professing Christian, and now he's not walking with the Lord anymore. What, what about him? What you're doing is you're, you're looking at the horizontal and trying to determine the vertical. And you don't start there. You start with the vertical. Everyone, everyone that the Father has given to the Son will be saved. Everyone that the Son has secured redemption will be saved. And everyone that the Spirit has applied the redemption will be saved. Every one of them will. And they will all be with him. Now, in this perfect relationship, he has now, in securing a, a, a people for himself, his love, the oneness that they share, is now manifested in the elect. In other words, when we are in union with Christ, 
At the moment of salvation, we're in union with Christ, and we will spend eternity with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that love of the Godhead that we see in perfect unison now has been expanded and expressed through the redemption of the elect. So that the love of God is in the people of God. Those whom he died for. So when you, when you think about salvation, don't, don't minimize it by thinking about something you did or some decision that you made or something you didn't do. Some people have the attitude, I'm a Christian because I don't do this and I don't do that. No. If you're a Christian, it is, it is by the grace of God. Why did he choose us? I, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, we, we know it's tied to his love and his glory. We, we've talked about that. I mean, but, but why me? I mean, wh why you? Why me? He chose the people. We don't have to know. All we need to know is that we are sinners and that we need the grace of God to save us and that God has sent the Savior to save a people. And what we need to know is that we need to be saved because of our sin. And run, run to Christ. And repent of any kind of self-reliance that you have upon anything that you've done or can do. And cling to Christ. And cry out with all your soul, save me. Because the only hope that we have is the grace of God. Father, we thank you for this lofty prayer. That even, Lord, as I have begun to just scratch the surface of the things that are in here, Lord, I, I feel the depth and the weight of all that is here. And yet, Lord, you have made Salvation known to the simple, to the, those who are childlike, dependent upon you. And Lord, I pray that that is all of us here. Lord, that we have realized the great gift of love and the great mercy that has been bestowed upon a people for your possession. Lord, use this in our life tonight to strengthen us in the security of our salvation and to draw us closer to you. This we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen.